It's a pleasure to uh, talk about X-rayverse. I've been working on a review paper the last decade of X-rayverse uh, work with uh, Duncan Galloway, and one of the things that struck me is really how broad and, and, and deep the field has become. Um, uh, both in the sense of nuclear physics, in the sense of detailed spectroscopy, something that wasn't done much uh, a decade ago. Uh, a wide variety of bursts, uh, looking in detail at individual bursts, but also looking at whole populations of bursts. So those are things that I will, will touch upon. And one thing that has come up in the last few years uh, based on uh, RSTE's uh, legacy is the first hints of uh, the impact a burst has on its surroundings. So that's something that I will uh, devote quite a bit of time on in this talk. So before, before I do that, I will just uh, go over a whole slew of things that will be interesting to look into with Strobex. Um, One characteristic feature of X-ray bursts is that they last very short. A typical burst is over within, say, a minute. So if you would make a new observatory um, and you would have to uh, weigh the pros and cons of having a large collecting area versus uh, putting your uh, resources somewhere else, then for X-ray bursts you want to collect as many photons as possible. You can't make up for uh, a smaller collecting area with just looking longer. A longer exposure time won't save you because nature restricts your exposure to a minute. And actually during burst we've seen uh, uh, oscillations in the light curve at the speed frequency of these neutron stars. And we've seen uh, fast flux variations of the order of milliseconds. So you really need to probe those very short time scales to be able to make progress. And a lot of progress has been made, as Hendrik has been saying. Um, detailed simulations, including lots of nuclear physics uh, input data, have been used to uh, describe uh, the tales of X ray bursts in, in a lot of detail, although still a lot of work uh, remains to be done. And we've seen since the 1970s thousands of X ray bursts, but still our model predictions of what types of bursts you're supposed to uh, observe under which conditions, for instance at a certain mass accretion rates, uh, that still uh, shows big discrepancies with observations. And uh, one thing that a lot of time has been devoted on um, is uh, looking into constraining the mass and radius of neutron stars using X-ray bursts. Bursts are uh, fairly unique uh, in that they can constrain both the mass and the radius at the same time. Um, model atmosphere uh, spectra have been developed to do that. Um, but there's still uh, some systematic uncertainties, and I think a lot of them are related to whether you're really looking just at the neutron star during the burst, or whether the uh, accretion disk is coming in, or some other part of the environment is changing during the burst and, and, and messing up your mass radius measurement. And I think that's something uh, where strobe apps will be able to contribute. So I'll be borrowing a little bit from uh, the Loft white paper on X-ray bursts that was quite detailed in showing what the lab can do. Um, here you see a nice complicated figure where on top uh, there's a simulation that I did um, while working for Dina um, of, uh, at, at the start you see uh, the light curve of these short hydrogen helium flashes. And then for fun, after a few flashes, a carbon flash goes off. This is a much thicker layer of carbon below the hydrogen and helium layer. And that produces a superburst, uh, a burst that lasts uh, just about a day. During that day, accretion of hydrogen and helium uh, continues. Uh, but because of uh, the, the heat from the carbon burning, all the hydrogen and helium burns away stably without triggering bursts. And then after a day, you've cooled down sufficiently for small, weak, fast recurring bursts to, to reappear. And that is a typical transition from stable burning to, to bursts by a millionaire's QPOs uh, that you get from, from simulations. At the bottom, John Hilsson, uh, 
uh, took the simulate the light curve and folded it through the wide field monitor's response. And so you see that, well, very clearly you can see the superburst. But also here in the inset, you can see that the, the regular hydrogen helium bursts uh, pop out uh, in detail. In the tail, the, the weak hydrogen universe that reappear there, they come to be picked out from the white field monitor that clearly. But uh, the lat will definitely be able to do that, and uh, the XRCA, of course, uh, as well. The XRCA will actually be even better for, uh, for that case because the weaker bursts don't reach as high peak temperatures, so the coverage of the soft end is uh, advantageous there. Um, so one thing that I expect to happen is that if, when the wide field monitor has a, a large coverage of the galactic center region where we have about 100 uh, bursting neutron stars, then we will be able to build up a very large database catalog of, uh, of X-ray bursts. Something similar has been done with RxDE and also with the Microsoft wide field cameras. This project is called MinBar. Uh, named after Babylon 5, uh, but it stands for the Multi Instrument Burst Archive. It's a project led by Duncan Galloway. And in this plot, you see all the bursts from these two instruments um, as a function of the persistent luminosity at the, uh, on the horizontal axis, going roughly from 1% uh, Eddington up to Eddington on the right. And vertically, you see the recurrence time, the observationally third recurrence time of these bursts. So you see that most bursts last uh, a few hours, uh, or have a recurrence time of a few hours. Uh, the longer recurrence times are likely times when we miss the burst in between, so those are upper limits. Um, but interestingly, in this study, you see this um, group of bursts with short recurrence times of, say, around 10, 20 minutes. And those were known before, but from such a large study that includes many different bursters, some accrete uh, pure helium, others accrete solar composition material, we found that these particular short recurrence numbers only occur from uh, hydrogen accreting neutron stars. And uh, recently that led to the development of new models where we showed that the mixing in of some leftover hydrogen into the, the, the hot ashes layer of a burst can reignite after a few minutes a second burst. So it's really the clues that you get from these large um, uh, burst uh, samples that, that give you ideas on how to fix the problems that we have in theory. Uh, one theoretical problem is very clear already in this figure, in that you see that the burst rate drops off roughly around 20% Eddington. And then here you no longer have any bursts. Um, the theoretical picture that I just showed you was that when you transition from stable burning to burst, that at the transition you actually have an increased burst rate. You have many short bursts recurring very fast. Whereas in here, that's clearly not the case. And that's a completely uh, not understood problem after three four decades of burst uh, research. How should you do that? That's not a selection effect, that it's hard to detect the burst with the baseline issues, right? Um, the bursts that we do see there are still uh, very uh, well detectable, and they're not uh, not weaker as the, the, the models predict. So they're just a completely different type of burst than what you predict there. It is a very important region of the parameter space because that's also roughly the accretion rate at which we see most of our superbursts. So the, the production of superburst fuel, carbon, happens there. And it happens in a burst regime that we haven't modeled yet. So that's my sales pitch for focusing on the wide field monitor. I'm taking it seriously. Another thing that uh, bursts are uh, good for is doing timing analyses. That's something that RSTE uh, pioneered when it saw oscillations in the burst light curves at the spin frequency of the neutron star. In fact, this is a method of measuring the spin frequency of, of uh, bursting neutron stars. 
And the idea is that uh, a burst ignites on one spot somewhere on the, on the star, and then the flames spread around the, the, the neutron star. And this causes a temperature anisotropy across the surface and induces oscillations in the light curve at the spin frequency. Uh, these are two simulated light curves of the, of the rise of a burst uh, by Simon Mamudifar. And the width of the band is actually the um, amplitude of oscillations that you can see here in these zoomed in insects. And the two different rises are for igniting on different parts of the neutron star, closer to the pole or closer to the equator. So that will cause the flame to spread in a different way. Um, I don't think with throwbacks we are at the level where we can see individual pulsations, but we will probably be able to track the phase if we group just a few subsequent uh, pulsations. And so that would be a very new thing, that you can actually track the phase uh, of the pulsations throughout the rise of, a, of an X-ray burst. That will be extremely uh, important for uh, tracking the, the spreading <coughs> of the flame. Uh, and actually, in the last few years is when we've seen the first uh, multidimensional uh, hydrodynamic models by uh, Yuri Kateki uh, modeling this flame spreading. So better observational constraints would, uh, would be very important for that type of work. Uh, one thing is that during one superburst, so one day long burst where we have more photons, uh, a special type of uh, pulsations was seen in only one case, in one superburst in 1636 with PCA and RSTD. Uh, the PCA only saw two superbursts, so it saw it in 50% of the sample. And uh, those were uh, uh, pulsations at a much lower amplitude, and they were uh, coherent, whereas in, in this case, because of the changing uh, phase, you will have uh, incoherent pulsations, or frequency frequency. So that's a, a pulsation that we don't really know what that is, but um, perhaps with uh, strobe action we'll be able to see it also during the short burst and not only during this one uh, uh, hours long superburst. And it could be an avenue of measuring the spin frequency of more of these bursting neutron stars. Um, so these superbursts and also long uh, helium bursts that we call intermediate duration bursts because that duration is in between the superburst and the normal burst. Um, they are very rare. We've seen 25 superburst candidates, only two in any detail with the PCA and RTE, the rest all with uh, wide field uh, cameras and all sky monitors. Um, a few dozen intermediate duration bursts. But when we see them, uh, they show uh, a great detail uh, that, that we don't see in, in a shorter burst. So to just pick out two things that you can do with a super burst and an intermediate duration burst, on the left hand side you see um, the data points of the super burst in 1636 that I just talked about, and then some models for the rise of the light curve of a super burst. Those were done in uh, a paper led by me, and the models are by Andrew Cumming. And these different uh, light curves are caused by a different temperature profile in the neutron star envelope left behind by the carbon flame. So the carbon flame ignites at the bottom of the envelope and then spreads towards the surface, and it deposits heat everywhere. And then during the rise of the, of the, the light curve of a superburst that lasts about 1,000 seconds, you progressively see uh, the thermal properties deeper and deeper in the envelope. So you scan through that temperature profile. And if you have just pure local burning, everything burns locally uh, as the flame passes through it, you will actually get not really a rising light curve, but a, a decline there. Whereas if you have a convective flame, it will produce this adiabat. And what we found is something somewhere in between which may mean that the flame is actually stalling halfway on its path to the surface. It doesn't reach the surface. So it doesn't deposit as much energy everywhere, but just progressively less. So this is a very cool experiment where you can directly 
follow the flame propagation of the carbon flame like they have in type 1 H3. Uh, but this is a very clean system where there's no debris flying around, so you can do this carbon uh, flame uh, propagation experiment uh, in great detail. But we've only been able to do this in one case. Um, if you would use the white field monitor to trigger on superbursts and you are on them within this thousand seconds, so within, say, a few minutes, then you would be able to, to probe this uh, once or twice a year. On the right hand side is the um, start of a long helium burst from OC14. And uh, on top is the RCE PCA light curve. And you see that within uh, a second, you actually lose the signal there. And the reason is that uh, in this case, the black button radius increases uh, uh, by a lot. And this is a, a case of super expansion. Uh, what happens is that the, uh, the black body temperature drops and drops below the uh, and energy band of the, of the instrument. With the XRCA, it can actually move into uh, the peak of the XRCA's affected uh, area. And you would be able to probe this in much more detail. One interesting thing was that once the signal came back after the super expansion phase, when there was still some regular expansion, um, the spectrum deviated from the regular black body in a, in a way that is consistent with an absorption edge. And an interesting thing that you could do is uh, use the gravitational redshift of such an edge to constrain the surface gravity or the, the mass radius of this uh, as well. Unfortunately, this uh, spectral resolution of the, the PCA isn't good enough to actually play this game. Um, but with the XRCA in the lab, the energy resolution would definitely be good enough. One thing you might think is, well, when we have such a large collecting area, can't we do this then also in shorter bursts than the intermediate duration burst? And the answer is probably no, because uh, to be able to get these uh, edges, you need to throw off the top layer of hydrogen and helium and reveal the uh, metal rich ashes uh, below it, so only very powerful bursts will be able to do this. So we need to go to rare uh, intermediate duration bursts and then again uh, slewing within uh, a very short time with the right field monitor uh, would be essential for this. In fact, in this case, you have to screw within a second. I don't think that's going to work. Uh, but we've seen similar bursts that last, say, half an hour uh, or uh, several hours, where the expansion phase lasts, uh, say, five to ten minutes. Those are quite rare. Uh, but the ones or, or twice that you might see it with a micro monitor, if you're on it, then you have an extremely important measurement. Okay, so that was very quickly all kinds of things that you can do with respect to timings, spectroscopy, bone burst, burst populations. Now I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the burst impact on its environment. Usually uh, we didn't have enough photons during a burst to see anything but just the black body from the thermal emission from the neutron star. But now recently with uh, especially with these intermediate duration bursts and super bursts where you have more photons uh, from RSTB, we started to see uh, indications that actually something is going on. So things that might happen is that the, uh, the burst might just uh, push out the inner disk. Or the radiation drag, um, or pointing Robertson drag, may actually drag material onto the neutron star. So things can go both ways. Um, the heating of the disk might drive winds, um, you uh, ionize the disk, which gives you a reflection signal, which is extremely powerful as a diagnostic in figuring out what's going on. And other uh, components that are around boundary layers between the disk and the neutron star surface might be affected. Uh, people have suggested that the corona will cool while it's being irradiated by the disk, although that's, that's still <coughs> Um, so, uh, reflection spectra is something that we've seen already yesterday when uh, looking at the creeping uh, black holes. Uh, 
these are some reflection spectra of uh, reflected black bodies uh, made by David Bellin uh, over a decade ago. The three models you see here are at, at different ionization states. Um, so the ionization parameter. And for each model you see two varieties, and those are for different densities. As Javier uh, showed yesterday, especially below, say, 2 kV, the reflection spectrum is extremely sensitive to the density and the composition of the reflecting material. Whereas in the XTE band uh, above 3 kV, that was not really the case. So when you combine the LAD and the, the XRCA, then the LAD will be uh, very powerful for constraining the, the iron line at 6.5 kV, the classical reflection signal. But there's this wealth of information that gives you uh, density and composition that you can't access that, that well in the higher energy band that the XRCA will uh, probe. Um, this will actually be a bit daunting because uh, we will need very large grids of models to probe this whole parameter space. And you can imagine how many uh, local minima there will be in high squared space when you try to apply these models. So that will be a challenge, but uh, the amount of information that's there is, is, is uh, quite large. So what have we seen so far? Uh, with XTE during the superburst, um, this one is from 1820-30, the other one seen with RSD. Uh, you, you see on the left-hand side the residuals uh, from fitting just a black body, and you see the iron line and the iron edge in the CA band. Uh, for the low uh, uh, soft uh, bands, in 2015, Swift XRT looked at a very long Kimberlin burst, lasted many hours. And on the right hand side, you see there the, the spectrum, and below there in the middle panel, the, the residuals that shows uh, substantial soft excess, and also a bit of an excess on the, on the hard side. And when you fit that with a reflection model that includes this free-free uh, continuum from reflection in the soft band, then you can, can describe that spectrum. Although there is not that much detail, you don't see any of these, these lines. Here. So all these reflection components have, it, to some degree, been, been seen, but not in sufficient detail to really extract things like densities and compositions and really see what's happening to the disk in great detail. Um, now we have NICER, and uh, one of the first bursts I looked at was uh, one from Mikula X1. I showed this at the head meeting for those who were there. And um, NICER does cover the, the, the soft uh, part, and you see also here a soft excess similar to what we saw with Swift XRT. But with Swift XRT, that was a spectrum that um, was taken over. Uh, say an hour, whereas here this is a five second uh, integration. And you can explain that also here with a reflection model, but there's not that much detail, so you can also uh, explain it by enhanced accretion that might be induced by quantum robots. Right? This is one simulation of strobecks. The residuals uh, that strobecks will see when looking at an X ray burst during 10 seconds. And uh, the detail in there is just stunning. Uh, you can see the, 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 the relative doctor broadening of the iron line in the lab to, to uh, the exquisite detail. And similarly, the, the features uh, in the soft end of the XRCA will grow. And in this way, I, if you do the simulation and you, you uh, try to recover the input parameters and the inner disk, of the, uh, the inner radius of the disk is recovered to 14%, the ionization parameter is better to than, uh, than a percent, disk inclination, uh, in safety profiles you, uh, in PDC. You can all recover these things in great detail. It will probably be not that uh, trivial. You will probably start probing reflection from different regions, uh, different radii throughout the disk. So this is an opportunity to first for the first time to uh, accretion disk tomography during a burst that lasts only <coughs> So you can see in detail how different parts 
of the accretion environment will be affected uh, as it's being suddenly irradiated by this powerful burst. So this will be an extremely interesting accretion physics experiment. What happens to a disk when you just suddenly bang it with a, with a strong burst? And it's a repeatable experiment because a few hours later another burst will go off. And uh, that burst might go off in a different accretion state when you expected the, the, the disk to have different properties. So you can probe all that within one source multiple times. So it's time to put up my conclusions. Um, the message I wanted to convey is that uh, strawbacks will be uh, an enormous step forward for actually bursts. Um, not just because of the, the large amount of photos that you can see with the XRCA in the lab doing detailed uh, reflection spectroscopy, uh, timing of uh, phase changes during the rise, but also because of the wide field monitor where we can probe a huge population of X-ray bursts and to start getting clues on how to fix our models to include burst regimes where superburst fuels. Thank you.